All right, good afternoon and good morning to everyone joining us today. I'd like to welcome back all of those participants who viewed last week's webinar. And for you first timers, we extend a warm welcome. This is the second in a two part series of webinars focused on technology in the judicial and legal sectors. I am your moderator, Damian Biltris, the National Develop Business Development Manager for the Judicial and Legal Markets here at Wolf Vision. We have Marta Scopa, our National Sales Manager, joining us today, who will be fielding questions and assisting me today. We also have two very special guests. We have Ben Cobble of the Clayton County Courts in Georgia and Jade Colden of BIS Digital. Today's topics are presentation technologies effects on courtroom performance, as well as courtroom and the courtroom in a post COVID-19 world. I wanna start by thanking you, Ben. You and Clayton County Superior Courts are one of our most recent additions to the Wolf Vision's uh, end user family. We're very happy to have you on board. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and your role at the courts? Sure, thanks for having me, Damian. Um, I work for State and Superior Court in Clayton County. Uh, in particular, I, I work for the judges of Superior and State Court inside of court administration. And my role is to make sure that the judges and their staff have everything that they need on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as relates to technology, um, whether that's laptops and computers for their back of office work, but then also uh, anything courtroom related, courtroom IT uh, for attorneys coming in um, all across the board, any technology in those courtrooms uh, that's, that falls under my purview. Fantastic. Now, Jade, BIS Digital has been providing technologies and services to its customer base since 1982, with a strong emphasis on the judicial markets. Can you tell us a bit more about BIS as well as your role there? Thank you. Thank you, Damien. I am um, I'm a regional sales director for BIS. I've been with the company since 1991. Uh, I directly lead a group of uh, account managers in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. Uh, the company actually is providing technology nationwide. Um, we started out in the Southeast and then the Midwest and then the East Coast, and now uh, we're, moving out, we're moving out to the West. But uh, we provide technology for courtrooms, city councils, county commissions, school boards, law enforcement. Uh, we started out selling cassette machines and as technology changes, we adapted with that technology and as a result became one of the national leaders in uh, multi-channel audio and video recording solutions for courtrooms and uh, the other markets that I mentioned. We have over 6,000 uh, digital customers out there and, and throughout, the, throughout our history of selling the digital recording, our customers ask us to provide more technology. And as a result, we came a full systems integrator. And that's how we came to partner with you guys as well. Fantastic. Now, this webinar is meant to be very interactive. We welcome all user questions. So please feel free to ask them during any time during our broadcast. Um, you know, we know a bit more about you guys already. Um, I'd like to learn about the types of guests that we have with us. So let's take a moment and see who's in attendance today. Last week we had folks in a variety of roles such as CTOs, judges and integrators. So Marta, can you pull up our first poll please? So our first poll question is what type of attendees do we have today? And you can answer judge, clerk of the court, uh, chief technology officer, or CTO, consultant, integrator or AV technician. Now it looks like we have um, you know, good uh, mix of all with um, primarily integrators on here. Um, we have about 64% participation. So those of you will, that haven't answered, we'll give you a few more seconds to answer before we end today's poll. Great. So it looks like we have a, a good deal of integrators today. We have about 63% of our audience is an integrator. That's fantastic. Welcome. I hope that you all learned something uh, new today about our sign up family of products. So gentlemen, as I was starting this to get uh, prepared for this webinar, I ran across um, a quote uh, from the use of technology, a judge's guide to pre-trial pre 
and trial by Deanne Simmers that states, good technology installations make court proceedings more efficient. Judges have more flexibility to impose time limits on lawyers because technology assists in making presentations move along more predictably. Lawyers can complete openings, closings, and direct and cross examinations in less time than it would take uh, using paper documents supplemented by enlargements or illustrations propped on an easel. I mentioned this quote because we all have seen cases where technology is an absolute enhancement to the courtroom. And then there's cases where the technology is so difficult or unreliable that it's an absolute detriment. Which leads me to Ben. This isn't the first time that your courtrooms have had a technology upgrade or integration. Can you tell us what your challenges were prior to your latest technological refresh of your evidence presentation solution? Absolutely. Um, one of the big challenges that we faced, we, we had an aging system, but along with that aging system, we weren't able to incorporate newer technologies. So we might have, a, we might have an attorney come in who had an iPad and they would walk into the courtroom and, and they needed to connect or be able to present something that they had on their iPad or perhaps uh, a defendant had in divorce court perhaps had something, you know, text messages that needed to be shown. Um, and that was always difficult because, you know, you had to take screenshots and email photos and this sort of thing, print them out, show them on a, uh, show them on some sort of document camera. Uh, it was always very involved. So one of the challenges was to be able to, to bring all these different types of technology together where we could have an attorney walk in with a laptop, uh, an iPad, a cell phone, whatever they had, and then they could present from that seamlessly. But the other challenge was that it needed to be simple. Um, we couldn't, we didn't have time for, the, the attorneys don't have time, the judges don't have time, and uh, you know, anyone related to, to technology doing training doesn't have time to train every attorney on every piece of equipment. Uh, it needed to be simple enough that someone could walk into the room and you know, press the green button to turn things on and, and know, how to, know how to work the system pretty intuitively. So those were two big challenges was to, to bring all these different pieces of technology together, but to do it in a seamless way that uh, people had access to very quickly. So who would you say led the charge? Was that a user-driven change or was there an internal uh, internal parties that really led that change? We had internal parties uh, who, who led the change. You know, from the beginning, when I arrived there, um, I knew that, that our goal was to, was to upgrade our courtroom technology. But the judges actually led a lot of that. They were very supportive of this because they wanted to see their courtrooms operate in a more efficient manner. Uh, and they wanted to see attorneys able to, able to address matters more quickly in their courtroom not just for not just for courtroom efficiency, which is always a concern, but uh, even just access to justice. That um, that when someone comes into the courtroom, that they felt that the technology didn't get in the way of their case being heard. They knew that their voice was heard, um, and you know, an old projector not working didn't make it to where uh, some critical piece of evidence uh, wasn't presented correctly or presented well enough. So the judges actually led a lot of that. It was, um, it was a group effort, but it was very important to us that the judges really bought in and drove that process as well. Okay, that's great. So Jade, would you say that that's a, one of the most common complaints that you get from your potential clients who are looking at BIS solutions? I would agree with Ben. I think he, he hit it on the, the head where it's connectivity and complexity. Um, if the system, is hard to connect to or it's hard to use. Those are those are the those are probably the biggest complaints that are out there when we're coming into a new courthouse. Um, it's just what can I connect with and um, how hard is it to use? Now, is that particular to a certain type of uh, courtroom or a jurisdiction, or is that across the board? No, I think it's across the board. I mean, all the, the building blocks are the same uh, from jurisdiction. To, or courtroom style to courtroom style, but you have to kind of, you have to adapt them to meet their specific needs. But I think connectivity and um, 
complexity are, are, are the biggest complaints across the board. Okay. Well, during last week's webinar, I asked Paul Prinemore of the Ninth Judicial Circuit of Florida to walk us through the decision-making process when it comes to technology in the courtroom. Ben, before we get to how sign-up was a fit for your courtrooms, I'd like to ask, um, you know, what was the, the decision that led you to select sign-up over other products? And can you describe to our viewers what your product evaluation strategy looks like? Well, really, the, one of the main things that brought us to Wolf Vision's sign app was the fact that it could integrate all these different pieces of technology. We had already implemented something where using some pretty basic technology, you could, you could plug an HDMI cable in and present. But what really drew us was the seamless wireless presentation. So uh, it's, it's not enough to just have a, an HDMI cable uh, or an HDMI port at each council table, for instance, uh, there are some instances where someone needs to present, present from the middle of the room, or perhaps you have an expert witness who uh, needs to present directly from the stand. Um, you know, we needed the flexibility to, to present from anywhere. And that's really what drove us towards, towards sign up. Uh, there's a, there are a whole lot of other features within that, uh, within the sign up that we really, that we really interested us, but it was the ability to have anyone from an iPad, Android, you know, Windows device, uh, Apple device, you know, like an, uh, an Apple laptop to present from anywhere in the room. That's really what, what drove us. Fantastic. Now, Jay, BI has started providing the sign up solutions to its customers in the judicial market, uh, probably at the onset of 2019. What was the catalyst for change? And was there a market need that wasn't being met at the time? Yes, um, we needed a piece of equipment that was user friendly, flexible, and beyond that, stable. Um, something that was going to work every time that we turn, turn the piece of equipment on. Um, I've been saying for some time, smartphones are driving technology right now. Uh, if it can't be done or you can't use your smartphone, uh, then that piece of technology is kind of outdated. So um, we needed something that would easily connect to a smartphone, a tablet, an iPad, um, uh, a PC base. So hardware agnostics was very important to us. And as Ben said, the ability to move around the room, whether it's an old courthouse that doesn't have any conduit or doesn't have very much connectivity in there, or whether it's a brand new one, where the attorney just simply wants to move away from the podium or move away from the, the law table. With a tablet or a smartphone, uh, they can walk anywhere in the courtroom and present uh, wirelessly. And so I think that was, that was very important. I think it's the flexibility and stability are, are, are the, the most important things for us. Very good. So as you can see, we have a variety of sign-up models from our original sign-up down to our sign-up pure and most recently our sign-up pure pro. Uh, we understand that not all courtrooms are built equally and needs are different, uh, which is why we offer a variety uh, to begin with. Um, now, besides sign up at Canadian County Superior Courts, we also have a Wolf Vision Visualizer. Um, in your case, Ben, it's the VZ3 Neo. And uh, recently, I don't know if you know this, but we released our first 4K vis uh, 4K visualizer the VZ8 UHD, which along with the VZ9.4F are recommended solutions for the courtroom. Now, Ben, we know that courtrooms such as yours, uh, sign up is not the only part of the solution. And when you were working towards a system design, what was the particular request from the judges that you thought had to absolutely be met? Uh, it goes back to what, uh, to what I mentioned earlier was simplicity and it had to be rock solid. It, it, we needed a solution that didn't require, you know, uh, a technician to go down to the courtroom every day to to make sure that things were working, uh, and then additionally, we needed it to be simple enough that anyone could just, uh, you know, click click a button on the touch screen to make it work. So uh, both of those ease of use again coming up, uh, but then also performance. You know, if if you're if you have, you know, eight or ten courtrooms or even more. Uh, as some districts have eight or 10 courtrooms going, you can't have a technician who's having to go troubleshoot on a, on a daily basis and show people how to plug in. And, you know, 
figure out why something isn't uh, wirelessly publishing. Uh, it, so it needed to be rock solid. Great. So, you know, I'm curious what our audience thinks. Marta, let's start our second poll of the day. Uh, whether you're the person making the request or the one who's receiving it, uh, we'd like to know what is the most requested technology upgrade in your courtroom today? And our possible answers are wired and wireless presentation, video conferencing, video distribution input output devices, uh, visualizers, uh, also known as document cameras, or all of the above. Um, now, Jade, looking at uh, our poll results, it looks like um, really a mix of all of the above is what users are looking at. What would you say, um, what do these, these poll results um, reflect what BIS is seeing throughout its territories? Yeah, and I, I, I think it depends upon the type of court. Jury courts have a different need than non-jury courts. Uh, but I think the wireless, I think wireless has really come into its own in the last, in the last probably 12 months. Um, and again, it goes back to the cell phone because I think there's so much evidence on there. But I think, I think as you talk to each court, their needs are always going to be a little unique. But uh, all of the above, it's good to have a product that can check all of the above boxes. And that's what the, the sign up product brought to us. Now, both you and Ben have um, really touched on the need in the courtroom as we move forward for uh, wireless BYOD presentation. Um, and it's funny because an old friend of mine once coined the phrase, simple to use, difficult to misuse, which is exactly how I feel about our BYOD capabilities across our Synapse products. Unlike some other solutions out in the marketplace, we are, as you both mentioned, 100% device agnostic and compatible with AirPlay, Chromecast, and Miracast. We also offer the ability to use older technology by using our vSolution Cast app. Now, Ben, has you said in some cases, as we were conversing offline, that some of your courts um, use less of the wireless BYOD and some use more. How, what, how is BYOD connectivity been accepted across all your courtrooms? It's been really welcomed across all of the courts. Different courts use the use uh, BYOD to varying degrees. Um, in state court, for instance, we have a lot of um, a lot of times certain calendars are are very basic and very straightforward. Uh, where if you go into superior court, uh, they'll handle a lot of of uh, higher profile, you know, felony type uh, cases, and those wind up you know, those wind up with uh, attorneys bringing in multiple devices that they want to show evidence from. So I would say across the board, it's been very welcome and it's been utilized in both state and superior court. Uh, but at different times, different courts will utilize the technology in different ways. And what's important is that, uh, what's important to me and to the judges was that no one is being forced to use uh, a piece of technology or a feature that they don't need. It's not uh, overly complicating a process uh, for uh, for the end user. So if I have an attorney and the, if, if there's a district attorney who needs to present something, they can do they can use as much of the technology as they want to use as they feel comfortable using. And then another user who who may be really excited about this or that feature, they can use that feature uh, to whatever extent they feel comfortable. So uh, that was uh, that's really important and it makes it to where it's broadly accepted because you're not forcing someone to always use a more complicated process than they're comfortable with. Okay, Jade, you know, one of the things you mentioned earlier that I, you know, struck an, uh, a chord with me and I completely agree is the fact that society, as a society, we've become very comfortable with wireless devices in our personal and social lives. Um, however, in some cases, adoption across the courts have been a bit slower. You said, you mentioned that you're being asked for uh, more BYLD. Is this increase 20%, 40%? Um, how much of an increase are you seeing across the board? 
I'd say it's probably even higher than that. Uh, traditionally, what's happened in the courts, the way that the, a lot of the older evidence presentation systems were set up is, is the court would have a PC, and then the attorneys would have to bring in their evidence on a thumb drive or their documents on a thumb drive or um, a, a USB drive to try to connect to that to the court's PC. And then the court had to make sure, or the attorney had to make sure it was in the right format that met that met the requirements of that court PC. Well, the BYD or BYOD eliminates the whole need from the court. It eliminates that headache. The court says, okay, here's, a, here's the ability to connect wired or wirelessly. Um, wirelessly, we don't have to worry about dongles. We don't have to worry about connectivity. We don't have to worry about any of that. And, and so I think as we're starting to see it, it eliminates some of the pressure from the court and allows the ease of use back to the attorney because if the attorney's coming in with their own iPad, if they're coming in with their, their tablet that they're accustomed to using, they don't have to worry about, okay, how do I connect to the court system? How do I make this work? They, it's a much smoother, seamless integration for them uh, or user experience. And then back to it's much more efficient proceeding in the courtroom because people are using their own technology. So, so I, think, I think the BYOD is, it's probably 75% or higher as, as a request in all the new, in, in the new installations. We're, we're seeing that trend go up as well as we get direct inquiries. Now, last week um, we had, you know, as I mentioned before, we had Paul on and he walked us through some of the security settings that helped them avoid unsolicited traffic on their network. Now, our team has done an incredible job of emphasizing the importance of enterprise level security. Out of the box, all of our products offer security features such as HTTPS encrypted connections and integrated firewall, and the ability to really lock down the devices. We also offer our vSolution Link Pro software, which Ben, you have seen, um, which allows us to, at an enterprise level, manage all of the sign up devices that are on your network. Now, I know that due to COVID-19, you had to cut your integration halfway through. Um, but when you think of security in terms of courtroom technology, how do you foresee using Synapse security features in your courtrooms? Well, one of the great things that I, that I really like about the Synapse device that we have installed, and we have three of those courtrooms that are fully functional, uh, is, that, is that it really does work out of the box. I'm not worried about, uh, I'm not super worried about the technology being uh, accessed inappropriately. We're using some out of the box features uh, such as a, a pin. So you can publish that pin or it can be a pin that, um, that you know, a judge could let someone know at the beginning of the day, you know, hey, here's the pin for you to connect. Uh, so we're using some of those basic out of the box features. And as we go forward, we may tweak and make some changes to that, but at this point, the fact that it uh, that it's fairly secure right out of the box, without us having to make a lot of configuration changes, we don't have to change our entire network structure in order to to secure those devices. Uh, that means a lot. That's great. Damien, we have a great question from um, our audience. This is from Bob, and he would like to know how do we make sure that not the right person gets connected and their content display during the proceedings? So there's a few ways we can do that. Um, one of them is, as Ben just mentioned, is the pin that can automatically change um, at different time intervals so that it's not always the same pin also. So if the judge gives out a pin in the morning and the court uh, goes into recess and comes back after lunch, that pin will be different and it'll change on its own. Um, we can also have a moderator mode where the judge first views um, the evidence that's about to be presented, and then they can release that to other screens within the courtroom. And then we also have the ability where even when you get on, the judge has to request the stream to become active. So you can connect, but unless the judge allows that, um, uh, he or she cannot present. So. Those are three ways we can um, stop someone from uh, going in and showing, showing some inappropriate content in the courtroom. And in addition, one of the great features that uh, we have is the ability to really control 
the signal strength on the antennas on the sign app. So we can control that decibel level. So, and, and last week, if those of you who were on um, would have, you know, you, you probably remember that with Paul's group, they're doing the same thing. And anyone who sits behind that rail in the courtroom cannot even see the connection. So moving along, uh, one of our key features of SIGNAP is the ability to control presentation fees as I was just talking about um, with either SIGNAP or other SIGNAP core devices. And we do this with our vSolution matrix, which uh, it's a feature that provides the ability to distribute content over the network. A lot of our end users request that a judge and attorneys preview evidence first prior to presenting to the rest of the courtroom to assure that it was deemed admissible. Now with vSolution Matrix, we can provide such functionality. And as you can see, we can first push content to our preview group. And once the evidence is agreed upon, it's sent to our published group. Now, Jay, BIS gets a lot of similar requests from its customers. Um, how does the ability to control the evidence bring efficiency to the courtroom? Well, I think even when it's not, when the preview is not brought up to us, we bring it up to them because we, we see it as an important feature that um, as this court is taking place or as a trial or hearing is taking place that as evidence is being presented that the judge and uh, both attorneys get to be able to view this before the jury or the public in the, in the courtroom get to view it. And so I think what this does is it, it controls, it gives the, gives the control back to the judge. So the judge has the ability instantly to stop that or or you can say, okay, yes, this works. The other opposing counsel can say, yes, uh, we agree to that. Um, and so just by streamlining the whole process, by giving the control back to that judge, I think makes everything much more efficient. Great, now Ben, from the courtroom perspective, what are the effects of inadmissible evidence that's been shown in the courtroom, just so our viewers can really understand um, the importance of these features? Right. Uh, evidence being shown inappropriately uh, can completely throw off an entire trial, depending on the type of trial and depending on the type of evidence or uh, whatever it is that's being presented inappropriately. I mean, you, you could have a mistrial. You could <laughs> you could undo weeks of weeks of work, weeks of whether it's deliberation, weeks of work uh, on the part of uh, of a jury. So you have taxpayers who are who are sitting there and they've taken time out of their lives to, you know, as, as uh, doing their civic duty there, um, participating as jurors. Uh, it, and it can be devastating also to, uh, to a defendant or uh, to really anyone involved there uh, if, if an entire court proceeding is, uh, is thrown off because of that. So to, for the judges to have the ability to either preview or to quickly uh, to quickly stop a stream, to, to stop what's being viewed, um, is, is absolutely critical to the process. And, and as you mentioned, there's, there's, a, there's truly a hard cost, and not just to yes. the individuals, but the court itself, right? Sure, absolutely. Gentlemen, so, I have a great question from the audience, if I can interject. Absolutely. Um, question. Can we record everything that goes through sign up and how do we make sure of the recording integrity so we can add it to the audition file, audio files? You can, everything that goes through sign up has the ability to be recorded. Um, we can record that and deliver it to off to your network server after the fact so that you can then view it um, and add it in some cases and Jade, you can add to this uh, where you can add it to the recording solution that's capturing the record. Yeah, with, with our uh, DCR recording solution, we take an output directly out of the sign app and run that into one of our video channels. And so anything that's presented uh, on the sign app is being recorded directly into one of our uh, distinct video channels. So everybody's accustomed to have an audio channel separation. We also have video channel separation with our system. And so we take an output out and, and um, capture that directly into our DCR. So everything that is presented in the courtroom, we are capturing and, and uh, making a record of that. 
And, and by doing that, you're actually capturing in two places. You can capture it on the sign app and in the recording itself. That is correct. We definitely touched on something that is of great interest of our audience, and we cannot possibly answer every single question live. So I just wanted to let everybody know that each question will be answered individually after our webinar, but I have a couple more that I would like to ask our panelists. Um, from Paul, can you give a specific name to the recording, meaning location in a trial? Um, the not in sign up, you're actually, you can do that after the fact. And does the active PCR we can, but okay. Does the active presenter have the option of content preview prior to getting it pu pushed to the courtroom and judge? Great question. You can, if you're using our sign app, um, you can view what is on the local monitor. And if you have the ability to then uh, use what's moderator mode from the touch screen, you can then push through the rest of the courtroom. And lastly, are you able to VLAN the wireless traffic from the wired network so you can allow BYOD only to connect and not touch the Zoom or other networks? Absolutely. Thank you. Great. So in addition to vSolution Matrix, uh, we offer a variety of tools that can be found on sign apps such as Zoom, Microsoft Teams, as well as an integration with WebRTC compatibility. So if you're using a Polycom or a Clear One Soft Codec or WebEx or Citrix Go to Meeting, you can use the sign app to log into those, into those meetings. Uh, we also offer an Office 365 integration, which allows you to access all of your files. And lastly, we have what's called vSolution Meeting. And while today's focus is primarily on the courtroom, I have to say that courthouses have conference rooms as well, and our sign-up products are a great fit for those conference rooms. With vSolution Meeting, you're allowed to book the conference room through your calendar application, as well as load any files that are prevalent to that meeting um, prior to going into that meeting space, so that when you walk into the room, your meeting space is ready, and all your files are accessible through the sign-up device. Now, Ben, last week when we spoke, you mentioned that due to COVID-19, the courts had really taken the, to the use of Zoom to conduct their activities. And as we pass, uh, move past COVID, what is the plan to integrate SignUp with those devices or Zoom with those SignUp devices? You know, we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at integrating Zoom and just trying to find, as everyone is, trying to find the best use of the technology because there are, there are so many options. Um, I know we, are, we already have judges who are using uh, the sign app within their courtroom in order to live stream. Uh, we, have, we have judges who are streaming to, uh, live streaming to YouTube, um, live streaming their Zoom meetings. So uh, before COVID-19, uh, as, we as we were beginning everything, you know, these were just options. Uh, now they're absolute, they're an absolute necessity. Uh, so I know we'll be integrating parts of that um, and the ability to, to live stream directly to broadcast is going to be critical for us. Uh, you know, I, I had a, a judge in Superior Court who was sitting in a courtroom. She had a, a, a couple of, um, a couple of people in the, in the gallery area maintaining, you know, social distancing. Um, a court reporter in there as well, but everything was being broadcast on YouTube. So you have open court, um, but, uh, and, and the, the uh, court reporter is able to take everything down using the BIS system that, that we have integrated and at the same time connected through SINAP, um, the judge and, peop and the people on the Zoom call were able, to, were able to be seen by everyone at the same time. So, uh, um, it's a it's it's something that used to be a little bit of an option and now it's a necessity and, and you bring up a great point because i'm seeing that request or that actually in some states it's becoming a requirement that any zoom meeting or any um web conference meeting that's used to conduct a trial uh has to be broadcasted out on youtube so with our webcasting feature pack 
you can seamlessly integrate YouTube Live right out of the box. Once you set it up, you simply hit webcast and off you go. So Jade, we've recently discussed the use of WebRTC. And so besides Zoom, which is obviously ultra popular now since COVID-19, what other platforms are you seeing requests for with, uh, with sign up? Uh, there's clear one collaborate space is one of those uh, go to meetings, WebEx and teams. I mean, those are the, those are the, the big group right there. Um, but I think the flexibility to go uh, WebRTC makes it open because right now zoom is popular. Um, and I'm assuming there's a bunch of companies out there that are developing uh, zoom type of uh, platforms as well that as I think as this, uh, as COVID, as COVID takes its place in history, uh, I think it's going to change the court forever. So I think this now becomes a part of our, our normal daily uh, connectivity. And so um, Zoom, obviously, by far the most popular right now that we're, we're dealing with. Okay. So Ben, I want to really start digging into how SignUp fits in your solution. So as you can see, I have a workflow of what your typical courtroom system looks like. Can you give us a brief overview of your courtroom setup? Absolutely. So from its very simplest, uh, you can see underneath the attorney tables, we have two attorney tables. Each of those tables has a, um, a high definition display on it, just a, a 23 or 24 inch uh, display. It's not a touch screen. It just shows whatever is being published. So, um, at the same time, the, on the wall that's it's visible from the gallery as well as from the jury box, uh, we have a large 80 inch display. Um, so, uh, and then the judge at, at his or her bench also has, ha they have a display as well. And the witness has a touch display. So you can have an attorney who comes in, uh, they can plug in via HDMI uh, or VGA uh, so they can have a wired connection if they if they need from their display from their attorney table. Um, we also have our own um, presentation PC, and that presentation PC also has a touch screen. So there are two touch screens in that room: one for the witness, and then one at our presentation table. So um, if an attorney does not have a laptop or they don't have a uh, they don't have anything that they want to connect they can make use of the court's existing uh, uh, PC there, plug in a thumb drive, uh, pop a disc into the, into the DVD drive. Um, and at that table, there's also, a, uh, there's also a visualizer there, a document display camera. So all of that goes through, uh, all of that goes through our, our rack that sits behind the judge's bench. And the judge is able to, to um, to stop the signal that's going through from wherever. Um, now, and I've only spoken there of really the wired connections, but with the sign app in the picture, that means that you could have an attorney who's sitting at that table who doesn't plug into HDMI at all. They just wireless, wirelessly cast from their, uh, from their device, whether it's you know, Android, uh, OS X, it, it doesn't matter. They can see that connection to the sign app and everything goes through there and it's just as if they have plugged in. So uh, the judge again can, can stop the connection, uh, can mute video for everyone uh, fr from there. So, and everything travels over that. So if someone has a, a YouTube video that they're showing, you know, the audio plays over the, you know, throughout the entire gallery, it plays on the overhead speakers. And when the judge presses mute, the audio goes away, the video goes away, and they can switch to another source if they want. So that's a really basic overview. Now in your solution, it looks like all the inputs ultimately pass in through SignUp and output out of SignUp, correct? Yes. And is this a typical setup for all six superior courtrooms? Yeah, it, it is of, of the three. You, know, uh, you mentioned that we were interrupted by you know, this, this pandemic that everyone is feeling the effects of. So uh, we're partway through our, our installation, but that, that is typical of, of the way that we're doing that. Fantastic. So the next several slides take us through what a typical integration with SignUp may look like based on courtroom size or even the need. So what we have on screen is our large courtroom concept, which takes full advantage of the B-Solution matrix 
uh, feature pack. And in this solution, we have a preview group and a published group. Um, and out of the published group, you have your uh, wall display, you have your witness display, and you have your jury displays. And this really keeps the evidence um, very, very tight so that the ability to have inadmissible evidence becomes very, very low. Um, secondly, we have our medium uh, courtroom concept, which uh, sees the, the sign up with the VZ 9.4 at the lectern. And you mentioned in your case, Ben, you have a PC at a presentation table where users can come in and plug uh, thumb drives, et cetera. Well, with the sign app, we can do the same. Uh, we have uh, a very robust document reader um, and uh, media reader on our, on our sign app, which can view all major types of files. So Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoints, PDFs, um, and most audio and video files as well. And in this solution, what we're doing is simply taking the, the presentation from the, the presenter at the lectern, pushing content to our core at the um, IDF rack, and from there it goes to uh, distribution. And lastly, we have uh, very similar to what the Ninth Judicial uh, had last week, where we have sign app at the lectern, and we're simply pushing to um, a large screen monitor on the on the wall. Now, I wonder how many of our audience members have plans to update their courtroom um, in the near future. So I'd like to pull up um, our third poll. And Marta, if you could please pull that up. So whether you're on an integrator side or you're an end user, um, we'd like to know when you're planning or when you're working on your next project for a courtroom. So is it the next zero to six months, the next six to 12 months, 12 to 24, or at this time, uh, you know, maybe you don't have plans because of the effects of COVID-19. And as our results come in with about half our participants in, it looks like a lot of users are still planning to upgrade their courtrooms from zero to six months. Now, Jade, as we look at these poll results, can you walk us through the process of designing an evidence presentation system for the courtroom? Sure. Um, the most important thing is communicating with that customer, finding out, um, well, pre-COVID, we were, we were doing lots of walkthroughs. We would go in and we would meet with the customer, find out what their needs are today and where do they think their needs are gonna be in a couple years? Because we wanna design a system that allows to be grown upon. Um, and with these systems, SignUp has made it a lot easier to design, quite honestly, because before we had to figure out where do we wanna have an HDMI input or where did we want a VGA input or where do we have, um, where are they gonna be pre presenting from? But the wireless connectivity allows that to be a much easier and a uh, simpler way to for the court to address that as well because now anywhere in the room you can present from. So basically what our, our goal is is to find out is, is where do they want to present from, what do they want to prevent, present from as well, not from where but from what, so what kind of devices, and then where do they want the, where do they want the output to go to because these systems are truly about inputs and outputs. What's coming in and where, where is it coming from and where is it going to? And so we may have some that have uh, individual monitors at each jury station in the jury box. We may have one that's got a, as, as we showed there a second ago, where it's just got an 80 inch or like Ben has an 80 inch monitor on the wall, uh, or we may have touch screens. So it's really about communicating with that customer and finding out exactly what they want to get out of this. And also finding out how much they want to spend because obviously the more monitors, the more touch screens, uh, the more outputs, the more money that costs. So uh, and this and I would does give us now, flexibility. And I would imagine now in a post, you know, going post COVID where revenues across the board are obviously down, you know, budget is, is something that's, you know, more prevalent than ever. Now, how do you see sign up being able to meet those needs because of the, uh, the amount of features that we, we offer? Well, I think because it is such a feature rich system, I, as when I first, when I first saw it, I said, this is an ev evidence presentation system in a box. 
um, it really took about five or six different components and built them into one, one very user-friendly platform. And so in today's environment, if the budgets are tight, it doesn't stop it doesn't stop our customers from starting on a evidence presentation system. As you saw the way that the ninth uses it, um, they're one of the most technically advanced courts in the United States and they're using it at a podium with a projector and a touchscreen. So, but if they wanted to, they could then expand and build on it from there uh, by adding a video distribution amplifier and, and some different things like that. So it really allows you, even when budgets are tight, it gives you a good place to start and, and to be able to move forward from. So the word that comes to mind is really scalability and the ability to scale to uh, a more robust system when, when those budgets are available. Now, we showed what we believe are typical concept drawings of courtrooms. Do you believe there's such a thing as a typical courtroom? Um, starting to be before it was the answer had been no because because you had to you had to hardwire everything in and so you had to worry about where were the connectivities and so did we want to connect it to podium do we want to connect it to the attorney tables do we have a presentation location do we want to connect it to witness um, now because of the wireless functionality some of those some of those become irrelevant anymore because we can connect from anywhere in the room so um, I don't think there. I don't think there is a standard, but the building blocks are all the same, and so it goes back to that scalability issue. Is here's where we can start, and then we can add outputs because that's really what you're looking for. What are my outputs, and um, and that's really this has allowed a design to become much more standard than we were doing, let's say, two years ago. Okay. Now, Ben, we've we've discussed that you're responsible. For for the superior courts, but we haven't mentioned that you're also responsible for the state courts, which are very similar solutions. However, even though the hardware may be similar uh, in workflow, um, or the hardware may be similar, the workflow doesn't necessarily mean that it's always the same. Can you tell us how workflows may differ in courtrooms? Absolutely. Um, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, but you know, different uh, divisions of court, they'll have uh, or different levels of court will have different types of hearings, obviously. Um, you know, in state court, you may have certain types of calendars that uh, they, don't require, uh, they don't require you to walk around the room presenting. Um, they, they may not need that. Now, it, it might come up that every, you know, every three or four weeks, you may be doing a jury trial where someone wants to be able to present from anywhere in the room. But uh, that's you know, one month or rather one week out of four uh, the other three weeks, it's pretty basic, standard, uh, someone plugging their laptop in. They're always in that courtroom. Maybe that attorney is assigned to that courtroom. And they, just, they just plug right in, almost like it's their docking station. Um, so different workflows for different situations. In state court, um, you, you see that a lot more. In superior court, you might have you know, a different attorney every, every day of the week. So... Uh, it really depends on the court, but that's what that's what we needed with uh, what we were looking for uh, when we partnered with BIS and and then Wolf Vision for this solution was that flexibility to adapt to both of those. And like I mentioned before, that the system could be as simple as you need it to be to to get that job done to work through that workflow, or it can be. Uh, it can not as complicated as you want it to be, but you could take advantage of as many features as you wanted to uh, for, uh, for other types of workflows. Great. So we all know that COVID-19 has really changed the way we conduct business, you know, in our daily activities. Um, and this is no different in the courts as well. And before we wrap up for the afternoon, um, I'd like to engage our audience one more time with, the, with our last poll. And Marta, can you please uh, bring this poll up? And the question is, in the courtroom post COVID-19, um, what would the activity look like? Will it be business as usual? Uh, will most cases be conducted in a virtual environment? Um, a hybrid between A and B? Or, you know, do we not have an idea uh, in some cases? And, and as we look at our poll results, it looks like it's, it's, it's a hybrid. Uh, with 80% of our 
or over 80% right now of our, of our users giving us that result. Um, ben, can you tell us what changes are coming to your courtrooms because of the virus? You know, we're still, as most people are, at that, uh, at that phase or in that phase where we're trying to figure out what exactly is going to happen. And we're looking to, you know, we're looking to our judges and to, and to um, you know, courts that are higher up as well as everyone discusses the best way to handle, the best way to handle this going forward. But uh, I can say that there, were, there are going to be changes. I think that when we go back to normal, it's going to be a new normal. Um, you know, in conversations with, with different judges, you know, the idea is, well, we need to have these options available. We need to be able to handle court remotely and, and not bring people in unless, unless it's absolutely necessary or have part of our workforce that can work remotely. They need to be able to work remotely as long as we're able to accomplish our workflow, you know, efficiently and effectively. Um, so there will be changes. It's going to be some sort of hybrid but at the same time, it's also, we still don't quite know, uh, but there will be changes. And the flexibility that is offered through, um, through something like SINAP uh, is going to be a critical part of that, of that solution to be able to live stream, broadcast, uh, connect multiple people remotely at one time. That's going to be a, a big part of it. So it sounds like while there may be some dramatic changes to the system workflow, uh, because of Synapse abilities, would you agree that you're kind of been set up for this uh, to uh, move fluidly? Yes. Yep. Jade, what do you see as the keys to successful evidence presentation uh, in terms of workflow post COVID-19? Well, I think Ben Ben's 100% correct. I think there's going to be a new normal. Um, I, I, for years, have been saying I think there needs to be more virtual court than there is, and, and court being very traditional in the way it's the way it's handled, um, that was very slow to come. This kind of forced that, and so I think all the systems that we have designed, or the way that we're designing systems, allow for the addition of that virtual piece, uh, whether it's a recording of it or whether it's the presentation of it or whether it's bringing in a witness. I think for a, I, I, I think forever the court has changed. And I think as, as the judges and the court participants get used to this, we're gonna start to see a lot more of the hybrid scenarios where part of the participants are remote because they have to be, whether it's an illness or potential, uh, potential to being ill, or let's say a snowstorm, let's say a hurricane down here in South Florida, um, where that we shouldn't have to stop the court. So I think, I think the ability to bring people in remotely and, and then allow the presentation to be shown to everybody, whether they are local or remote, is, is going to be a huge piece. I'd like to pose just a last closing question from our attendee because it speaks directly to the current situation and what will happen when we settle to our new normal. So this question is from Pat and we are looking to see how we could use technology for jury trials. We are contemplating having jury sit in a remote or separate room while watching the trial and evidence presented. How we can make sure that the software is secure or transmission is secure. Thank you. Well, and I'll let Ben get into this uh, further, but the first thing I can say is using V Solution Matrix to transmit um, portions of of the trial, at least the evidence presentation part of it, um, from one sign-up to say a sign-up core, uh, will give you the ability for your jurors to see the evidence in a very secure, um, clear, and efficient manner. Now I know. Ben, we were talking about how you're thinking of spacing out courtrooms um, to allow the use of, of, of juries in them. Could, can you give our, our viewers uh, some insight on, on what Clayton County's courts are, are thinking about? Well, right now, one of the things that, that is being considered is, and, and none, of, none of this has been really settled on necessarily, but um, the remote idea is is something that we're thinking about you know possibly having jurors in one room um having jurors in one room and having that data live streamed 
you know, it still remains to be seen if that's going to be a feasible, a feasible option. There are a lot of things to consider. You have, you know, you have attorneys who are used to seeing people face to face and that human element is critical. It, it's an important part of the process is to be able to, to have, you know, an attorney who's able to see the jurors faces and notice facial expressions. And then the same goes for uh, someone sitting in that jury box to be able to, to look at a witness and and look in their eyes as they're as they're presenting or rather as they're um, as they're giving testimony. So a lot of these things are still up in the air, um, and we're just trying to find the best technology in order to uh, in order to make sure that that uh, these processes are you know maintain their integrity. The technology is there. It's a matter of how the courts will decide they want to implement that technology and what works for them. Marta? Thank you. There is no more questions. Okay, great. Have. Well, Ben and Jade, I wanna thank you again for joining us today and providing your insight. I know that a lot of our participants are looking for ways to improve efficiency in the courtroom uh, workflow, especially in these uncertain times. Uh, for more information, please feel uh, free to reach out to me at damian.biltras at wolfvision.com. Um, if you would like to keep up with Wolf Vision, we can also be found on all major social media platforms by searching at Wolf Vision or visit, visit us on the web at www.wolfvision.com. Uh, thank you, everyone, and please stay safe. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.